hope I am uh, visible now. I'm going to restart. Uh, so today's webinar is about global developmental delay uh, and cerebral palsy. Cell therapy for um, cerebral palsy as well as global developmental delay. Today's seminar, I'm going to start with an outline about cerebral palsy and global developmental delay. Uh, uh, going to uh, be uh, talk more in detail about what is cerebral palsy, what are the causes of cerebral palsy, what are the types of cerebral palsy, what are the symptoms, what happens, how, what, what do you see in brain imaging. Uh, similarly, a little bit about global developmental delay and then about cellular therapy or regenerative medicine or what is popularly known as stem cell therapy. So uh, what is cerebral palsy? Uh, many, many of us know this term, but uh, what does it mean? It means cerebral, that is the brain matter, the cerebrum, the main brain, and palsy means affectation or uh, movement disorder or injury to the brain leading to the lack of movement. So it, it is a, there is two components. One is the brain per se, and other is the damage to the brain. Generally, what happens is, uh, due to some factor, there is a lack of oxygen, that is hypoxia, uh, to the brain, leading to ischemia, that is shortage of blood flow, and then encephalopathy, that is brain damage. So hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. Many a times, uh, uh, doctors and neurologists put HIE, and parents wonder what it means. It just means that because of lack of oxygen, there is damage to the brain, and that leads to what is commonly termed as cerebral palsy. So what are the types of cerebral palsy? I'm sorry, uh, technical error. Um, so the types of cerebral palsy are depending on the area of the brain which is damaged, if you see that uh, when you see these are two parts of the brain and if one part of the brain is affected, the motor cortex, the part of the brain responsible for motor uh, movement of the limbs, you see that one part of the body, the opposite part is affected or paralyzed. When both the parietal cortices, the uh, part of the brain responsible for motor movement on both sides of the brain is affected, then you find that both the hands and both the legs are affected. If the affectation of this cortex is much more and goes uh, much beyond uh, just the parietal cortex, you see a quadriplegia, which is much more severe, that is a neck down paralysis. Another type of uh, quadriparesis is dyskinetic cerebral palsy, where there is a paralysis, but it is not may not be complete. It is more due to the deep parts of the brain, which is affected that is the basal ganglia and the thalamus. Uh, we also see another type of uh, cerebral palsy that is the ataxic cerebral palsy. The last one here, when you see that the small brain, the cerebellum is affected because of which you get the child is more, is incoordinated, uh, um, is, is unable to speak properly, swallow properly, and has like a drunken gait or a drunken movement, incoordinated activity, and that is ataxic cerebral palsy. So a spastic CP, just to give you a visual idea, you can see that there is adductor spasticity and the legs are crossed like scissoring pattern. There is increased muscle tone, limbs are generally underdeveloped, uh, movements are very stiff, there is increased tightness uh, you can see here a child with spastic cerebral palsy uh, the legs are very tight the therapist is barely able to uh, manipulate them and the child has a scissoring gait you can parents feel that the child is able to walk but this is a involuntary spasm like uh, reflex movement which is actually happening at the spinal level, not really because the brain is controlling it. The other is the damage to the basal ganglia or deeper parts of the brain leading to a fluctuating tone in the body. So when the child wants to do voluntary activities, there is tightness 
and the child is relaxed, there is the child is loose. So, for example, when the child is sleeping, is completely happy or normal. But when the child wants to go and pick up something, the tightness increases. So that is known as a dyskinetic or dystonic cerebral palsy. Uh, when the cerebellum is affected, small brain, the balance is affected, and the child has incoordinated activity. So this is an example of ataxic cerebral palsy. Sorry, the video is not playing. Uh, there could be a mixture of these. Some children may be purely spastic or purely dyskinetic, and there could be a mixture of spastic and dyskinetic both, depending on the area of the brain damage, and that would complicate the matter much more because we are dealing with much much more complicated or a mixed cerebral cause. So these are a few examples. And of course, there could be an addition, intellectual disability, disability, vision involvement, hearing involvement, and schizos, which would complicate the cerebral palsy. So what are the causes? Uh, generally, the, the most common cause is hypoxia uh, due to or, or brain development delay or uh, lack of oxygen due to a low birth weight. So, so when the child is in the mother's womb and the development or the weight is not Proper, properly increasing due to anemia or nutritional issues in the mother or some other issues, then the child's brain development is most often affected. Uh, then there could be, of course, maternal factors. Uh, there could be a problem at the time of birth, and that is uh, trauma when the child is coming out. Could be, of course, metabolic errors, infections, congenital brain abnormality, uh, hypoxia when the child is inside of the womb and genetic or chromosomal disorders. So uh, all these could lead to brain damage and sometimes we call them as cerebral palsy and sometimes we call them as a global developmental delay. So uh, before birth there could be congenital problem, the brain development itself is affected. So many times we see polymicrogyria, the brain development tissue is less and hence we get uh, not so many ups and downs or salkangyria, the brain looks more flatter. Uh, infection um, uh, in the mother when the child is in the mother's womb, injury due to lack of sufficiency of oxygen or trauma during birth and after birth there could be a problem of viral infection or bacterial infection or hypoglycemia or jaundice leading to cerebral palsy. Uh, sometimes wrongly administered drugs, failure to uh, carry out appropriate test at the right time, for example, RH incompatibility, um, no action taken immediately when the child is distressed, um, uh, sometimes hy uh, hypoglycemia unnoticed, and starvation uh, because the child is not able to suck. So what happens? When the child is supposed premature, uh, in, for example, intrauterine uh, infection in the mother may trigger a premature birth and during that time the child is still developing there could be a intraventricular hemorrhage bleeding inside the brain uh, uh, there could be problems of connection placental insufficiency leading to hypoxia uh, there could be infection inflammation leading to release of uh, cytokines and other reactive oxygen species leading to periventricular leukomalacia that means that the cells around the ventricular zone, which are actually the stem cells in the brain, these are uh, damaged. Uh, on an MRI, it looks like a white tissue in the ventricular, periventricular zone, and hence known as periventricular leukomalacia, which is a indirect um, effect of the hypoxic ischemic uh, damage. And these children are at high risk for developing cerebral palsy. So what are the early markers? How can we know that the child could develop uh, cerebral palsy? The, uh, the child is floppy when the child is head, is unable to raise the head, uh, or is stiff when you hold or cries too much, doesn't suck properly, uh, either cries too much or is very lethargic, head control doesn't develop properly, the child doesn't look here and there, doesn't give proper eye contact, and sucking is weak. Uh, we, we know the developmental parameters and 
if the development is not as per the scale uh, initially is understood to have delay development and if there is a history of a perinatal insult with an MRI to show hypoxic uh, issue in cerebral then it's labeled as cerebral palsy. So the child may have difficulty in walking, difficulty in gripping, hypotonia, neck holding issues, sometimes breathing issues, poor balance. Uh, along with that, of course, there could be a lot of problem. Intellectual disability, the child may not be able to walk. The, uh, because the child is unable to stand or is not made to stand, the hip may get dislocated. Sometimes even shoulder is dislocated because of hypotonia or sometimes of, because of too much spasticity. Uh, there could be chewing and swallowing issues, she's always associated with cerebral palsy, the behavioral issues, some of the cerebral palsy children have autistic features as well, vision impairment, uh, again complicates the vision impairment could be because of prematurity of retino, uh, ret prematurity at birth, uh, leading to retinopathy of prematurity, so that is an eye problem, sometimes there can be vertical visual impairment that is damaged to the vision part of the brain. Uh, or they could be optic nerve atrophy, the nerve is damaged. Hearing impairment sometimes in case of torch infection, rubella infection, uh, intrauterine could be, uh, there could be problem in hearing and other associated issues. Uh, hip is an important part, uh, the, if there is a bony issue then that needs to be corrected because that leads to a uh, bad prognosis in terms of improvement in such children. So all children should have x-ray regularly. Statistics. Why do we need to know about cerebral palsy? It's important because the numbers are huge, even in a developed nation like the United States. Uh, it is, the prevalence is seen as 8 lakh plus patients. In Australia, 60,000. In China, 22 lakhs. Uh, in Ireland, 8,000 uh, per year. Uh, in India, 10,000 infants are born. In, in the US, 10,000 infants are born each year who develop cerebral palsy. 1,200 to 1,500 preschool children are identified to have cerebral palsy. And 764,000 children and adults in the US have cerebral palsy. So the number is high. The world population reports that uh, the prevalence is 1.5 to four per thousand live births, which is a huge number. So common areas of brain damage, the whole of the brain could be affected, the deep part, the green part here could be affected, the cerebellum, the small brain could be affected, or the whole of the big as well as small brain could be affected. So what do you see in the MRI? There is a whole lot of things that you can see. This is a normal MRI. You can see that these are the sulci and gyri the gray matter of the brain like a, a cauliflower which is nicely blossomed and you know is healthy uh, so this is the normal brain here you can see mild affectation you can see the cortex is thinned out and the you can see ventricles is much more prominent and this is much more severe here the third picture you can see that the cortex is thinned out and you can see so this is much more severe this is called ventricular megaly, like the ventricle inside the brain, the fluid filled cavity appears larger. It should look like a slit, but it appears big because the brain matter is less and it is squeezed and the rest of the area gets taken over by the fluid. So uh, ventricular megaly uh, indicates uh, development, could indicate developmental delay, motor cognitive as well as visual deficit. Um, there could be seizures along with that. So there could be along with cerebral palsy high risk of autism and sometimes if there's a blockage to this flow of the CS, uh, CSF, there could be hydrocephalus as well. So the spell size increasing but the brain matter is lesser. Then that what we saw was gray matter injury. This is your a white matter injury. So these cells of the brain, the cortex, gives out white rings which connect with each other, talk to each other, network and send signal to the areas below. So when this uh, wiring is affected, it is called as white matter injury. Uh, here you can see much more easier, better the white part, the white matter, the corona radiator or the connection which finally forms 
the corpus callosum or the connection in the brain is affected. So the connectivity or the electrical wiring of the brain is affected. So that again may cause, depending on which wires are affected, accordingly the deficit would uh, be seen. So as I said, periventricular locomalacia, you can see this is the ventricle, periventricle around the ventricle, the white panda, you can see. The cells around the ventricles are damaged. These are the cells which actually would multiply, go to the rest of the brain and form different layers of the brain. So when you see periventricular leukomalacia, indirectly it means that overall the number of cells in the brain are less. Uh, the cells here, the stem cells which would multiply are affected or damaged. Gray matter injury, uh, apart from the cortical cells, the deeper parts of the brain, here you can see the basal ganglia, the area of the brain which controls the movements is affected. Could, that's why it could lead to choreoacetoid cerebral palsy as well as dystonic cerebral palsy. And here the thalamus, thalamus is the triangular or a diamond shaped part of the brain which connects the right side to the left and vice versa. So the information or sensory processing within the two hemispheres is affected. When there is a severe damage to the brain, you can see gliotic areas. What this gliotic area means? It means that there is damage to the brain and that damaged cells are now dead. Body's own mechanism is to basically uh, convert it into fibers or make it like a fiber uh, to make it become a scar tissue in the brain. So that is a dead area in the brain. A gliotic scar uh, is many a times responsible for uh, uh, development of seizures or epilepsy in a child with cerebral palsy. It could be heterotopia. Heterotopias are cells in the brain which should not be there or are cells while the development is happening. They, there are pockets of cells which do not have any connection or relevance to the rest of the brain. Um, so these can again give rise to epilepsy. What you see here is a corpus callosum. You can see this white U-shaped part inside the brain matter. This is the corpus callosum or the connection which is grouped together, bunched and uh, these are uh, Parts of this is the wiring in the brain. This is a normal corpus callosum, as opposed to that, you can see here very thin corpus callosum. So, when the cells in the brain are less, obviously the connectivity or wires they will send out will be lesser. For example, if there are thousand cells in the brain, then we expect thousand wires. While if the cells in the brain are 800 or 500, the number of wires would be that way 500 or 800, and thereby the corpus callosum, which should have a bundle or a fiber, a fiber bundle of 1000 fibers will uh, have 500 but be thinner. So that is known as thin corpus callosum. Thereby, the electrical connectivity is less the signal or a message that the brain will send out to the lower areas as well as the spinal cord is much uh, weaker. Sometimes the corpus callosum is not formed at all or is formed abnormally. That is known as a genesis or this genesis of corpus callosum, which is a developmental problem, again leading to all delayed development. This is cortical atrophy. You can see that the cauliflower-like cells are shrunken. It looks like shriveled cauliflower, with the rest of the area being the white part being filled up by fibers of fluid. So this is a cortical atrophy. These are the fiber tracts, which you can see on enhanced imaging, known as DTI, diffusion tensor imaging. The uh, higher form of imaging that we use now is a PET-CT scan of the brain, which gives us a functional or a metabolic output of the brain. So the MRI gives us the structure of the brain, and the PET scan gives us the function of the brain. So here you can see the blue part here, which is uh, the red arrow is showing, is the basal ganglia, which should be completely green or possibly yellow, which 
whether and yet generally higher has generally higher activity in a normal brain here you can see is blue which means low functioning again here you can see the middle part here which my arrow is pointing to is the thalamus so the basal ganglia are thalamus here are functioning less control of voluntary movement is affected eye movements cognition as well as emotion so children with choreoethetoid cerebral palsy have um, uh, too much involuntary movements uncontrolled movements along with intellectual dysfunction you can see here basal ganglia now here is fine a little bit lower in functioning but majorly affected here is the thalamus thalamus is responsible for relay of sensory and motor inputs from one part of the brain to another also it regulates the sleep and wake cycle cerebellum here you can see my arrow is here is the part of the brain is the cerebellum that is responsible for coordinated movements posture muscle tone as well as fine motor activity articulation the motor area you can see the main cortex partly green partly blue again indicating lower functioning of the cortex so a little bit about global developmental delay uh, global developmental delay uh, indicates uh, when there is a delay in the functioning uh, the various areas could be affected only gross motor or fine motor uh, affectation could be there along with that speech language may or may not be affected understanding may be affected uh, social emotional act, uh, issues could be affected or activities of daily living there could be uh, affectation of one problem or many together maybe a little bit or or severe the causes it could be a whole lot of causes similar to cerebral palsy uh, uh, genetic causes genetic causes if there is a problem in various genes most common that we see is down syndrome uh, trisomy 21 uh, then uh, all these various uh, syndromes leads to uh, various multiple problems brain development is affected but along with that there could be cardiac issues there could be bone development issues uh, there could be hernia there could be um, uh, polydactyly even the formation of limbs are affected so there could be multiple issues in chromosomal and genetic conditions metabolic uh, there is a problem in the amino acid cycle or there could be problem in the uh, galactose pathway or then acquired uh, fetal alcohol syndrome very common uh, 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 when the mother, uh, the child is exposed to alcohol, uh, when in the mother's womb, again leads to multiple issues along with brain development being affected. Predominantly, nutritional issues when there is deficiency of iron, B12, folic acid. So the neural tube defects are seen. Infection most common is a torch infection, toxoplasma rubella, a cytomegalovirus, and herpes uh, infection. Um, uh, of the mother leading to defect in the development of the child uh, stroke sometimes uncom uh, unknown causes stroke may also cause uh, uh, within the womb may cause brain damage and other congenital anomalies uh, perinatal issues or prenatal issues both is exterior due to infection due to stroke low birth weight metabolic issues again uh, toxins Uh, exposure to lead, mercury, infection, uh, stroke, trauma, poor nutrition, and sometimes undetermined etiology. Sometimes consanguineous marriages as well. So again, prenatal causes, genetic could be acquired, could be uh, a, a combination of both. So there are multiple causes which can lead to affectation of the brain development and may not strictly fall in the category of cerebral palsy. And hence, then labeled as global developmental delay. Sometimes the cause is known. Sometimes we are able to pinpoint what the problem is, and sometimes it remains we remain clueless. But uh, through all of these, we do know that there is something wrong in the brain which is causing a delay in the development of the child. Uh, the cross and fine motor could be affected. Hand-eye coordination. The child could have dysmorphic features, which could uh, point out to the fact that it is not a, a, a simple cerebral palsy. It is a developmental delay due to some unknown genetic or chromosomal factors. Most of the time, these children are hypotonic, have very poor muscle tone, speech and language uh, impairment could be associated with this, as well as vision affectation, 
cognition and autistic features. Uh, activities of daily living finally get affected because the brain development itself is not ongoing. So again, what are the treatment options both for cerebral palsy and for global developmental delay? If you see that really uh, uh, till very recently, nothing, uh, nothing for the brain per se, but overall, yes, rehabilitation, all kind of therapies, medications to reduce spasticity, uh, medications to control seizures, uh, medications to control movement, involuntary movement, sometimes that is hypothyroidism, so thyroid, uh, thyroxine, and diet and nutrition, uh, for example, seizures, for seizures, ketogenic diet, psychological intervention, and all rehabilitation, when there the are deformities, like orthopedic deformities, or hip dislocation, or spasticity leading to deformities, surgeries for the same. Uh, so, as I said, medications, all these different medications, uh, type of tightness, Botox, or surgical intervention, like uh, rhizotomy, when the spasticity is very severe and not responding to any medications, orthopedic surgeries uh, for local release of contractures, as well as uh, correction of deformities. Physiotherapy, physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, aquatic therapy, psychological intervention, diet, Nutrition, all of these uh, are the pillars of the treatment for cerebral palsy and global developmental delay, but is it enough? Are we doing enough? Are we addressing the main issue in the brain? We are not. And that's why uh, the need for cellular therapy or regenerative medicine or stem cell therapy, whatever one may like to call it. So it comes as a ray of hope, just as all these revolutions. Uh, um, have changed the way we live our life. Stem cell therapy or cellular therapy or regenerative medicine has brought a new, a positive way of thinking along with holistic rehabilitation to help children with cerebral palsy and the global developmental delay to improve. Um, so there are many, many conditions, incurable uh, conditions which can be addressed with uh, cellular therapy. And we need something definitive because the numbers are huge. So let us first understand what is the concept of cellular therapy or regenerative medicine. Stem cells are basically tools for can be used for regeneration of various parts of our body and hence uh, become part of the regenerative medicine. Uh, these are special cells which have the ability to multiply repair, replace, and regenerate that part of the body in which we uh, basically transplant them. So very simply put, stem cells are cells in our body which are akin to the stem of a tree. Stem of a tree gives rise to branches uh, and when proper fertilizer and water are uh, given to this stem or this seed, then uh, the branches give rise to leaves, flowers, and fruits. Uh, similarly, there are cells in our body which can multiply manifold and become any part of the body. All of us at one point of time were uh, stem cells in our mother's womb. These cells multiplied many, many fold and when they were about 32 cell stage and next they uh, could actually be when uh, developed in the laboratory could give rise to any tissue of our body. These are known as embryonic stem cells. Uh, these cells then, as they multiply and grow and differentiate, can form the whole fetus. When the child comes out of the body, the cells are still growing, the stem cells are still forming various organs. And when we are an adult, most of these uh, stem cells, uh, their utility is over, uh, they become inactive, they reside in these different parts of the body, but they are quiescent. However, there are certain areas of our body which multiply lifelong and are the uh, possible source for adult stem cells. So how do these cells work? Most importantly, these cells have the capacity to multiply many, many fold. One cell can multiply to thousands of cells. Depending on which part of the body you are putting them into and what signals you are giving them, these cells can convert into or transform into those cells. Like these, are, when you put them in the, into the liver, they can mimic the hepatocytes. When you put them in the heart, they can uh, 
connect with the endometrium when we put into the spinal fluid they can eventually become nerve cells what is most important is they release many different kinds of chemicals um, uh, they release immunomodulatory chemicals known as cytokines and they release growth factors which can stimulate the repair and repair and regeneration in different parts of the body they improve blood supply and thereby improve angiogenesis that is new angiogenesis formation of new blood vessels and um, uh, basically being the conduit to give oxygen to that part which is damaged so what exactly is regenerative medicine we see that this is the brain where there is damage these cells go and repair the damage and improve brain functioning so the different types of cells that i spoke to you about first is the um, embryonic stem cells taken from three to four days embryos uh, these were one of the earliest cells in 1998 which actually had a lot of promise uh, but uh, due to one ethical issues um, because many religions consider that at the time of conception uh, the egg has life and if we use these embryos then we are killing a human being uh, so on those grounds the lot of research got stopped also these cells have the potential uh, characteristic or theoretical potential to form teratomas or tumors and because of these two reasons currently these cells are uh, not suitable for clinical transplantation however because of uh, this understanding all the other types of cells got um, you know uh, basically merged into the same uh, thought but we do have other cells like placental cells or cord blood stem cells as well as adult stem cells which do not have any do not have any ethical issues we are not killing an embryo and do not have the potential to form teratomas and are suitable material for clinical transplantation so when we are talking about uh, the um, research being banned and the cells forming tumors we are actually talking about embryonic stem cell while adult stem cells actually circumvent circumvent both these ethical as well as scientific um, issues or uh, objections of various scientists as well as religious background and hence uh, one would uh, one should think twice before actually generalizing the whole stem cell field and when we actually uh, we, we actually say that alcohol and homemade orange juice are both beverages and hence uh, they are toxic to the body so we need to differentiate that and understand that other stem cells do not have the issues uh, that embryonic stem cells have hence a new origin we use adult bone marrow derived stem cells which are safe they are non tumorogenic they never form uh, tumors they have no rejection issues they are taken from the patient's own body uh, they are not killing an embryo no ethical issues and easily obtainable using very thin needles so what is the scientific basis for stem cell therapy has it come yesterday uh, was it discovered uh, just recently no uh, the scientific uh, um, basis is much much uh, older um, no other field in the in the um, in research or medicine has ever received three nobel prizes in the span of 40 50 years except stem cell research Way back in 1990, uh, Dr. Thomas received the Nobel Prize for a demonstration of stem cells in the bone marrow. Uh, 2007, so Martin Evans was uh, uh, given the uh, award Nobel Prize for uh, isolation of embryonic stem cells. And recently in 2012, two scientists received the award for uh, something known as induced pluripotent stem cells. Internal, uh, even our textbooks have um, a discussion and chapters about uh, gene therapy and stem cell. Uh, in India, our ex president spoke about India's commitment to stem cell research. Our prime minister, uh, in fact, went ahead, met uh, Professor Yamanaka, who is a Japanese scientist who received the Nobel Prize in 2012 to see how this technology of induced pluripotent stem cells could be brought over to India.
uh, he wrote uh, also a, a, a preface for a book that he wrote on muscular dystrophy. So which neurological conditions can be treated? Autism, cerebral palsy, intellectual disability, muscular dystrophy, uh, spinal cord injury, traumatic brain injury, stroke, dementia, and other conditions. The scientific basis of the work that we do uh, is huge. We have been, uh, whatever we do, we analyze uh, and publish. We have 96 publications on various uh, conditions that we treat, including autism, cerebral palsy, and other conditions. We have been invited to write book chapters on cerebral palsy, on physical disabilities, and other conditions. So the old thought was that once the brain is damaged, it cannot be repaired. However, the new thinking uh, is that yes, with cellular replacement, uh, regeneration and repair is possible. All over the world, when we look, uh, there are at least 32 publications in cerebral palsy, where 988 uh, patients have been treated with an average of 82% success rate with uh, the only, if at all, minor side effect, uh, nausea, vomiting, local pain, and the site of, uh, the site of injection, fatigue, sleep pattern changing a little bit, uh, slightly more, uh, the increased frequency of schizoids, uh, a transient because the brain is stimulated, but can be controlled with medications. Types of cells which have been used are formulated stem cells, bone marrow derived stem cells, peripheral blood mononuclear cells, olfactory from the nose, olfactory and sheathing cells, human embryonic stem cells and human stem cells. Route of administration which has been uh, tried is intrathecal, that is spinal fluid, intravenous, IV, um, both together, subcutaneous, into the brain directly and intramuscular. So how is the treatment done at Neurogen Brain and Spine Institute? Because our focus is to reach the brain uh, and we're using patients' own stem cells. Uh, we are using uh, bone marrow derived mononuclear cells. We take bone marrow from the patient's own body uh, and inject uh, it intrathecally. So we can see that the bone marrow is removed using a very thin needle. Bone marrow is like thick blood. The child is sedated at that time. So there is no pain. Then this is cells are uh, processed in the laboratory on the same day within a few hours. There's no multiplication, there's no culture that is injected using a very thin needle into the spinal fluid. Uh, the spinal fluid, the CSF itself is a very good culture medium and we believe that the body's own um, culture medium will be the best uh, medium for the multiplication of the cells and we put it in the vicinity of the brain. We do not in inject inside the brain because that would be risky and giving intravenously would dilute the cell in into the system. So we are inject taking out the bone marrow. These are the cells that we finally get. This is a very concentrated form of mononuclear cells uh, with different types of cells counted and calibrated and then injected. Uh, this cocktail or mixture contains all these different types of cells. You find endothelial progenitor cells, we find mesenchymal stem cells, multipotent adult progenitor cells, uh, Miami or marrow isolated adult multi lineage invisible cells, multipotent adult stem cells, very really small embryonic stem cells, and a major portion of the hematopoietic stem cells. Injected into the spinal fluid here, and through the fluid reaches the brain or the part of the brain which is damaged. It will not go to any other place because this is the only place that the spinal fluid goes around. It is safe because we are injecting after the spinal cord ends, so we will not damage the spinal cord. The cells have a homing instinct. They can sense where the damage is and go. Cells do not get diluted into the system because we are going into the spinal cord. So what are the results? So in cerebral palsy, though we have treated over 1,200, broadly in 660 analyzed patients, we find about 91% success rate. Um, our publication, uh, uh, first of our publication that we have published um, uh, shows improvements in various areas uh, such as sitting, standing, walking, ambulation, leg movement, overhead activity, uh, hand movement, tone of the body in, in the diplegic cerebral palsy, in quadriplegic mainly neck holding and sitting balance, standing and walking with support, in dystonic and uh, dyskinetic and ataxic patients, coordinated activities improve. Now,
Now, let us see how this works. If you see immediately, as soon as the cells are injected, what we find is that the oromotor, we see central part improves. So, oromotor improves, the um, tongue movement, lip movement improves, involuntary movement reduces, voluntary controls become better, and there can be a minimal neck holding within a week or two weeks. The up to three months, we see improvement in cross motor of activity, midline crossing movements getting initiated, initiation of finger closing and opening. It's easier for the parents to handle the child now. Child is much more cooperative for therapy. There is improved tongue movements also seen. Uh, trunk control becomes better. Sitting balance becomes better. Supported reaction, when you make the child sit, he, he initiates movement and wants to balance his body. So this is up to three months. Between three months to six months, we see uh, support required for sitting becoming lesser, initiation of weight shifting, initiation of uh, ability to take weight on the hands and legs, improving um, uh, the different movements becoming much more clearer, chewing becomes better. Uh, after six months, then standing balance and taking step improves. Aerial activities uh, can be seen better, increase in motor movements, development of equilibrium, so balancing reactions becoming better, and speech as well as showing improving. So overall, we see slowly that the, the disability becomes less and abilities improve. A most recent uh, analysis, which is still not been published, uh, but just for the interest of your analyzed in detail, 262 um, uh, patients over a period of three to 22 months, uh, 179 being males and 83 females. The 80 below the age of 5, 99 between 5 to 10 years, 10 to 42 between 10 to 15 years, and 41 above 15 years. Now, what we see uh, similar, we can see that here uh, in we can see that upper limb out of 243 patients in whom upper limb is affected, 136 improved. Standing improved in 132 out of 248 patients. Sitting improved in 128 out of 198 patients. Similarly, movements, uh, involuntary movements improved in 40 out of 90. Um, head control uh, better in 52 out of 82. Uh, similarly, upper limb tone became better in 86 patients. So we see about 40 to 50 percent in every area improving. Uh, so in some it may be more and in some it may be less. Uh, when we see the scores, we see that GMFM, GMFCS, and FIM all improving and significantly improving. When you look at outcome measures again, the GMFM show and FIM show good improvement, though, though there is a change in the GMFCS also um, from one scale to another. This is the book chapters that we have written in Vedas. This is the first the publication that we have published on cerebral policy. Uh, on the PET scan, let us see what are the changes on the PET scan. You can see here, this is before the treatment. You can see the basal ganglion thalamus affected. You can see after the treatment, the, the damage is improved. The green indicates good functioning or normal functioning. You can see here, temporal cortex, lateral as well as medial, green showing improvement. Again, thalamus affected before the treatment, improved after the treatment. The cortex, much less functioning has improved after the treatment. Overall, we can see that here again, occipital lobe area for vision has improved in functioning. Cerebellum, low functioning has improved in functioning. Thalamus again, less has improved. Cerebellum has improved. So there are, these are the various changes thalamus has improved. We will uh, see a few case reports. Again, you can see a lot of low functioning areas have been improved. In spastic cerebral palsy, this is a four year old child with a cerebral palsy. You could see earlier he was w sitting, his posture was you know, stooped. Now he's much more stable. He kneel walking, he doesn't require any support at all. More confident, independent in kneeling with one leg independent in sit to stand uh, and even to some extent walking 
uh, no, maybe not normal, but much better improved. Uh, if able to get up from the floor more independently, this is before and this is now. I hope the videos are uh, visible. Uh, walking independently has been achieved for now. So started standing and walking independently. So this uh, are the changes that you see in a spastic child, cerebral palsy. Again, another child, five year old cerebral palsy child, you can see that all fours, his balance has improved. He has started crawling like a regular child, or it was hopping. Knee balance has improved. Kneeling has improved earlier needed support. So you can see progressive improvement in this child as the child uh, is along with stem cell doing good exercise and rehabilitation. You can see ability to sit up from the floor. Even vision correction has been given. So with the specs, it's very cute. But also his ability to do various activities has improved. Imitation skill, eye contact. So overall development earlier you could see that earlier he could hardly walk and needed a wider base of support and now he is able to walk much better with two crutches. This is his brain, how it was before. You can see all these areas, thin cortex, lot of blue areas. This is before the treatment. You can see after the treatment, as if the brain has started healing. And you can see more green areas, even the cerebellum and the thalamus has been. Another child, this child, in fact, uh, apart from having cerebral palsy, also had hydrocephalus, and uh, we chose to treat him without correction of the hydrocephalus. There was hardly any neck holding. You could see the head is really big. Uh, he could uh, not even have anything that supported sitting also. So with some now uh, slowly crawling uh, started, he could perform sit to stand much better. Earlier was completely uh, needed support when he started you know, uh, uh, get training and uh, is able to now walk with some support. A case of dystonic cerebral palsy, another time, a six year old child. In three months, you could see you can see the changes earlier. So much of support required, even the, the leg. Uh, needed so much uh, support. You can see the change in him. is doesn't require support. His trunk control is much better. Crawling is much better. Uh, reaching balance in quadruped is better. There is dystonia, but voluntary control is much better. Speech has improved. He is more responsive. Uh, Hand-eye coordination is much better. He's able to reach to his target much better than before. This is a four-year-old child. Again, you could see that earlier crawling was just hopping. So what you see is each movement becomes much more visible, becomes much more independent. So from a hopping to an alternate movement, uh, that's the achievement here. Can walk on the knees earlier would just tumble down. Uh, it could get up. It can now get up from the floor and climb the table. Earlier needed so much support. And he also responding to the therapist. Sitting is improved. Earlier needed support. Now he is able to uh, sit independently and use his hands much better. Gripping has improved. Crawling over steps. So this is the way that he is progressing uh, slowly. What the therapists are doing, whatever therapy is being done, stem cell helps to fasten the process. So what you would achieve in one year, you may be able to achieve in three months less than six months. So the axial, because the brain activity is improving, the uh, signal which is sent back by the brain becomes much more uh, uh, stronger and faster. Another child, this is a case of a very, very severe dystonic cerebral palsy. There was, even cognition was affected, would not cooperate, had so many tantrums. Now, much more coordinated. In fact, cognition has improved, cooperation for therapy has improved, 
tantrums have reduced he he is motivated to now stand much better is holding his body better uh, is taking independent steps is much more erect so overall coordination of the body uh, for walking sitting all activities has improved uh, this was a extremely a severely dystonic child and came to us at, at the age of 11 years it exists cerebral palsy a uh, very uh, a very very significant case came to us at the age of 4 years and by 6 years is now ready to go to school so crawling has first crawling improved independent crawling then standing without support ability to sit and stand independently ability to climb the uh, you can climb the window walk uh, verbalize vocalize uh, understand cognition it now he is able to um, identify he is able to say use um, identify body parts vocabulary has improved um, now you can see that he is identifying animals um, wearing his own clothes uh, so finally he is ready to go to school and now the parents have you know enrolled him in the school we are happy uh, so finally the idea is complete rehabilitation of the child an 8 year old child the cerebral palsy uh in females you can see she's attacked with cerebral palsy again trunk control much better she doesn't need any support even crawling is much better earlier extremely uncoordinated uh, grip of the hand uh, in terms of on the gripping the floor uh, was not so good she her um, hand would be always twisted now even the kneel walking is better less of falling walking also much more coordinated and controlled getting up from the floor it is much more coordinated 13 year old child again with cerebral palsy uh again okay, half kneeling you can so this cancel therapy various you can see our rehabilitation specialist working with the patient as well as training the parents to be able to do the therapy back at home um so what the parents are encouraged to you can see writing writing is much better writing is cursive writing is possible now uh, cross leg sitting is possible or there is too much spasticity that is not even able to attempt that a correction of vision along with the pain improvement spec spectacles to an object from the floor that means balance and coordination is important This is a three-year-old child with severe brain damage. I want to show her brain damage to you. She was all right till the age of three, but had this uh, accident where she was suffocating inside uh, a car. Uh, so you can see severe damage before the treatment, and slowly the brain function has improved. This is before the treatment. All of this brain is damaged, and slowly you can see the area of vision. There was no activity at all, and now you can see that. so she started seeing vocalizing ability to control her body improved so good improvement in this case um again this child she was he was hardly able to stand needed supported standing completely now you can see kneeling independent standing independent ability to do quadruped much more independently earlier needed support even for the hands able to get up from the floor much easier So all this in three months, you can see swinging independently. Earlier was crying and had a lot of fear. Awareness is better. Able to get up independently. Uh, this was not possible earlier. Able to walk now. A child was not able to stand is now able to walk now. You can see the brain here. A big gap in the brain. This is the glyotic scar I was talking about. That will not fill because this is dead tissue. but the area which are functioning less have improved and the area around the glyotic scar scar starts uh, to become more active so uh, we will now see a uh, few cases of uh, this is the child i want to talk about he is a case of very very severe cerebral palsy you can see the gradual improvement in 2016 This is how the brain looked. Only 
half of the plane, nothing in the lower half. Okay, after 2016-2017, you can see that the brain functioning, which we even we were not sure this can happen, the damaged brain has started, you know, evolving. And this is now in 2018, a whole lot of the parietal cortex has come back. And clinically, also we can see changes in this child. You can see here early no Yeah. You can see that this child is completely bedridden, so difficult to maneuver him. Now you can see the face also has become much more uh, you know uh, interactive. He has severe visual impairment. Even to some extent, he is started uh, visualizing. Looking at his parents, sitting balance is improved. We can now pull to sit earlier. You can see complete support, severe tightness with stem cell, multiple stem cell procedures, and with very good rehabilitation. The child is now doing stepping. So, a child who was completely bedridden with severe tightness is now responding to passive movements also. So, this is the progress in a child who was one of the most severe child he had. Child with hypotonic cerebral palsy, really low tone. Before the treatment, you can see his tone has improved. His posture is much better. Uh, he is also looking around better. Though as a squint, his visual perception is improved. Uh, he can balance himself better. Earlier, he had no interest at all. He can maintain sitting uh, position and, and crawling position now. He can get up with minimal assistance. Earlier, you could see, even if you pull, he was not initiating. You had to pull him completely. Sit to stand with minimal assistance is now possible. Standing with very minimal, like a finger uh, help uh, in standing. So a lot of change in this child. Even um, cognitive improvement, use of hands, picking up object and placing it in the right place, responding to commands and stimulus earlier. He has a lot of sensory issues. Now he's much more focused. Uh, he's taking interest in uh, playing with toys. Earlier, he, was, he had a lot of sensory issues. The sensory, even sensory issues have improved. This is a 21-year-old girl, very, very motivated girl of cerebral palsy with severe um, tightness is now able to roll better, she's able to sit better, and recently uh, new news is that with a, a, a wide based walker, she is now able to ambulate uh, much more independently and is joining ITI to learn computer programming and use of computer. So um, it's like a rebirth for her at the age of 21 years. She has now the motivation to be able to to re look at her life and do something and go ahead. So tightness is reduced, long sitting is better. She's able to sit and balance better. Speech has improved beautifully. What she speaks earlier, her parents could understand now. Everybody can understand what she's uh, speaking. New motivation, renewal of motivation to do something and get out of the house and get rehabilitated completely. So this was her brain before the treatment. You can see improvement in the brain function. So we will now see a few cases. There are n number of cases actually of cerebral palsy. So, but a few of global developments are here. Now this is a four-year-old uh, child diagnosed of global development delay with all the issues that a cerebral palsy child would have. However. There was really no uh, birth history which would contribute, uh, and uh, we could call it CP. Uh, MRI was normal, so no structural damage, and the child and his first child was diagnosed as global uh, developmental delay. You can see the damage on the PET scan. You can see that functioning of the brain was very low. This is before the treatment. All various areas were functioning less. After the treatment, you can see a whole lot of improvement the green areas becoming more, uh, even the basal ganglia. So all of these areas have started functioning better. So this is a child's uh, scan after three months. You can see here that you know he's 
uh, not cooperating. He needed complete support for standing. You can see here his standing with only uh, help of a uh, cord, able to take objects. So hand functioning has improved. Much more uh, uh, interested towards activity. Earlier, you could see that complete resistance to standing and walking. Now he is able to train, uh, uh, get trained better. Standing is better. Earlier, full weight on the caretaker. Attention has improved. Is able to do holding and using and responding, reaching out is better. So hand function has improved. So overall, there is a holistic improvement in the shine of global development today. Another case, who had a child who has difficulty in walking, maintaining standing balance, a problem with fine motor activity, uh, inability to express. Uh, the mother had a history of uh, uh, reversal of fallopian tube, non-consanguinous marriage, full term, a normal delivery, cried immediately after birth. History of uh, neonatal jaundice only uh, uh, and was in the incubator for nine to ten years. Delayed developmental milestone and when the MRI was done, found to have leukodystrophy. Uh, no history of seizures, child of honor, rehabilitation program for delayed development. She achieved milestone but regressed after some time. So the MRI, when she came to us, showed that again that the corpus callosum is involvement and a whole lot of midbrain and cerebellum is involved. Uh, as well as the white matter is affected. Uh, we can see the PET scan before the treatment, the cortex is involved, as so is the cerebellum. After the central treatment, you can see the cortical improvement uh, is seen. So this is our video. You can see earlier, attempt to stand and kneel was difficult. Now she can she attempt to kneel and kneel, walking independently by herself. Uh, sit to stand, she can do herself. Earlier, she needed support from support. Earlier, balance while walking was very difficult. Now, with minimal support or no support, she's able to climb stairs. Um, holding pen uh, is much better. She can write now, which was not possible earlier. Reading activity, fine motor activity has improved. Tongue movement, voice clarity, speech is better. So, there's a holistic improvement where there was regression. Now there is an improvement. She is going ahead in spite of the leukodystrophy. She can remove her shoes. So we find that earlier we treat the children better the results because the brain is much more pliable and uh, we can remove and wear her shoes. Another case, again, difficulty in all activities needs assistance, hyperactive, poor formation, non consanguineous marriage, uh, milestones were delayed. History of seizures uh, is there. Uh, Diagnosis of global developmental delay. Even the MRI shows gray matter heterotrophy or, or bunches of cells and generalized brain atrophy. So, uh, this is a five year old child with a lot of even autistic features and hypotonia. Earlier, she, uh, she could not lift her arm, she could not grip, sitting balance and reach out was affected. Now, you can see after treatment. She is much more responsive. She wants to do. She can walk much better. She is more active. She can vocalize. You can see a difference in her whole uh, containers itself. Improved understanding can point to objects um, and is much more uh, able. Is can sit independently. Um, can climb with lesser assistance. Um, and overall, she is progressing from where she had actually stopped progressing to improve walking, balance is better, walks with a walker and slowly uh, uh, she can walk with one hand support much better. Another case, uh, unable to stand and walk independently, unable to crawl, uh, all the uh, areas, even cognition affected, non consanguineous man marriage, no prenatal issues, full term C-section, child was diagnosed as, as global development they had eight months, a uh, microcephaly in the MRI, corpus, corpus callosum, this genesis, improper formation of corpus callosum as well as the brain. So the whole brain uh, it was affected in this case and in a year. So earlier, uh, not only physical but also cognitive issues, now she's much more responsive, uh, much more playful, walking is much more, it is independent, earlier needed support, 
she can imitate better she reciprocal kneeling is better she can sit up which was not a stand up from sitting not possible earlier and walking independently cognitive improvement as well as speed as well as uh, physical improvement seen in this child so again holistic improvement not only in one, one area but every area this child who could barely stand is now able to walk and climb stairs without anybody This child again, a stubborn uh, child, unable to stand and walk independently and poor formation, non-consanguinous marriage. Um, the, uh, uh, this child was diagnosed to have Angelman syndrome on genetic testing. One episode of Shizor at the age of three years. MRI showing only mild prominence of the ventricle. Does not have cognitive problems at three months. Uh, what did we see? We saw at three months that this child who could barely walk and even uh, focus was not good is now able to walk much better with one hand support, is able to climb stairs much faster with one hand support, or little bit two hand support to climb. Walking without support uh, has been, he has been able to actually climbing stairs. So, overall, a lot of motor function improvement. Uh, balance is improved, can pick up stuff from the uh, uh, floor is not good. Issues of uh, fear of or swings as reduced is, is a happier child now. Takes interest in play now. So, all of these improvements were seen after the treatment. 11 year old child with global developmental delay. MRI being normal, but also also had comorbid intellectual disability. She was very difficult to manage, extreme volunteer. And she see that earlier, she had difficulty even writing. Now she writes fast and with proper uh, understanding, uh, beautifully able to identify shapes, uh, understanding has improved. It's faster than her uh, activities. So a lot of cognitive as well as physical improvement. She mainly had a lot of cognitive improvement, behavioral issues, and temper tantrum. Now she is much more cooperative. Earlier she was, she would hit people. Uh, is able to maintain eye contact, and uh, cognitive improvement is seen very well. Four-year-old child with global development a lot of hyperactivity, no academic skill, difficulty in running, jumping. Uh, came to us with MRI with minimal leukomalacia with EEG uh, consisting of uh, the light epileptic uh, discharges, so uh, possibility of seizure disorder and global developmental delay. Three-year-old child, you can see in four months the improvement. Uh, she is able to sit better. She is able to name objects better. She is much more uh, cooperative. So. We see not only physical improvement but also cognitive improvement. Hand-eye coordination is much better. Earlier had difficulty in putting uh, uh, blocks into the pets, onto the pet vocalization. Uh, meaningful vocalization is observed. So here you will not be able to uh, hear any sound. Uh, you just have to take my word for it. So cognitive and speech improvement uh, is seen in this child very well. Requesting objects verbally. So, uh, a child, uh, when a child comes young, we can see holistic improvement in these children. A five year old child with a lot of sensory issues, low confidence level, dependent for all activities, hypotonia. Uh, uh, there was a history of third degree consanguinity. She Achieved all her milestones over delayed, um, diagnosed as a case of developmental delay. You can see she had a lot of uh, cognitive and behavioral issues. Now she's cooperating better, uh, can do a lot of activities uh, better, independent in daily living now. Uh, climbing stairs, motor function has improved, uh, it needs less support. Self biting behavior and hitting others is reduced. Crossing the obstacle means less supply and less uh, less uh, help and less prompt. 
better concentration and attention that neurosin we work on all areas holistic uh, uh, effect um, areas and you can be independent feeling so this is the last a three year old boy he came to us from australia he was not diagnosed so you can see that he has dysmorphic features uh, and mara uh, also showed problem as well as pet scan you can see improvement in not only understanding and physical issues but also following commands and and uh, responding to external stimulus so uh, whatever may be the chromosomal or genetic issues uh, we can still see improvement we see also improvement in down syndrome which are not covered in this webinar uh, when we look at uh, complications no major complications as such no reversal of the neurological condition is seen there is a possibility of a transient increase in seizures in 3% of cases which can be controlled or reduced to less than 2% by proper anti epileptic cover by giving proper medications a possibility of spinal headache and transient pain and nausea vomiting within the stay of the hospital is possible so it's overall safe treatment and improves quality of life of a patient this is neurogen brain and spine institute in navi mumbai we have treated over 8000 and sorry this is a wrong figure 8500 patients from over 80 different countries this is our infrastructure uh, this is a state of art uh, laboratory as well as uh, uh, operation theater uh, this is a stay facility in house stay facility with a comprehensive rehabilitation a combination of uh, cellular therapy with rehabilitation and holistic care so uh, stem cell along with neuro rehabilitation because neuro rehabilitation is like the water and fertilizer for the stem cells a multidisciplinary approach this is the pediatric uh, physiotherapy setup then the adult uh, rehabilitation setup pediatric occupational therapy setup adult occupational therapy setup speech therapy psychological um, um, Uh, therapy or cognitive rehabilitation, special education, diet and nutrition, special facilities like aquatic therapy, uh, sensory integration therapy, or the child development center, hand rehabilitation, and walking track for spinal cord injury patients. Uh, published books over fourteen books published uh, both for professionals and caretakers on various subjects. This is our core team, Dr. Alok Sharma, our neurosurgeon and director, with us. Um, accreditation for GLP, GLP, and ISO certification and awards, national as well as international awards uh, for various for for being the best stem cell therapy center in India. And to end uh, with Obama's speech, thank you uh, for patient cheering, and I would be happy to take questions. So I'll be taking questions now. So I'll be reading off one question and. Answering, Mr. Sukhi Dilwan has asked, "What is the difference in the cells from one company to another when the cells are extracted from the same source? One facility turns into cancer and other did not. Uh, what are the number of stem cells injected, and how long do you culture the stem cells to generate sufficient number?" Um, I'm not sure what you mean by the first question. How one, when taken from the source, same source, one turns into cancer cells and the other did not? That's really not possible. Uh, as I said, embryonic stem cells have the potential to become teratomas. Uh, those are the cells taken from uh, uh, in vitro fertilization embryos or the test tube babies. Um, these cells, which are genetically manipulated, like using retroviral vectors or uh, DNA um, uh, transformation, like use pluripotent stem cells, have a small potential. of converting into cancer um uh, what we are doing basically is we are taking the bone marrow and we uh, what we do is before uh, taking the bone marrow we are stimulating the body by giving something known as granulocyte colony stimulating factor now this uh, factor uh, stimulates the bone marrow to produce more cells and the bone marrow then we are uh, we take the mononuclear cells uh, we do not multiply the cells outside the body which in fact when you multiply mutations can be uh, taken uh, can be acquired and that can 
cause a problem of tumors in the future and hence we just separate the mononuclear cells inject them into the spinal fluid where the cells will multiply in a natural environment the um, number of stem cells which are injected what we inject again is a, a mixture of uh, cells mononuclear cells which i had told earlier in my um, presentation uh, the number of mononuclear cells generally is in the um, uh, is in the range of 50 to 200 million cells uh, shweta mohan wants to know about cases of lysencephaly uh, yes uh, i lysencephaly basically means that the brain matter the gray matter has not multiplied enough so uh, if the cortex should have thousand cells now it has possibly 500 and less cells so the number of cells are less and, and the grooves or the sulci and gyra are less in these cells also we do see improvement in the cortical function when we do a pet scan we find that the cortex is thin and is functioning suboptimally the stem cells will stimulate the cortex to function better and improve the function so even in license therapy, it is possible to improve function, yes. Can ADHD be cured from this? Madhu Sudhan wants to know what is the treatment available for it. For ADHD, first of all, you should try uh, other remedial methods as well as medications. If medication and remediation and rehabilitation does not help, then stem cell therapy does have the potential along with these therapies to help improve the understanding and learning capacity of this child cognition and comprehension improves and whereby the child's behavior can be uh, modified child's concentration and attention does improve i am a 42 year old can stem cell benefit me sindhu i would we would need to know more kindly reach out to us what kind of a problem you have uh, depends on what your problem if you are a 42 year cerebral palsy we have treated a 40 year old cerebral palsy with a diplegic uh, cerebral palsy or uh, in fact working in the western railways in mumbai and we have been able to help her improve her uh, performance but we need to understand uh, your condition better my daughter has walking problem and balance problems are this treated. uh mr chavez uh, please do reach out and send us more details our contact details are contact at neurogenbsi.com uh, we should be able to have, help your child if it is a cognitive or if it's a neurological uh, condition we should be able to help sindhu says that she has cp uh, sindhu uh, we should be able to help you it depends on what cp do you have diplegia how severe is your deformity how tight is your uh, how much spasticity do you have um, definitely after this tensile of uh, individual who is uh, older uh, we, we will need to work out much more exercise becomes much 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 more important in an older um, case of cerebral palsy genie is saying thank you my pleasure uh, can infantile spasm be cured by stem cells so please send the email address and contact information infantile spasms no epilepsy infantile spasms will not respond to stem cell but a patient with the brain damage and developmental delay along with infantile spasm can be treated <coughs> however infantile spasms will require medication but please do send us more details <coughs> at contact at neurogenbsi.com this presentation would be emailed to you with all the contact basic details uh, and then mr suresh kumar's <coughs> so Mr. Suresh Kumar is asking, there is an improvement in cases after stem cell treatment. My question is, is there anybody treated to become a normal functioning person? How to study significant improvement in cases? Yes, if you start early, uh, uh, rather than normal, I would say independent, functionally independent children. Yes, we have seen as, I gave an example of a child who was four years old and came to us with severe issues is not going to school so depending on when the child comes to us we will and how severe the problem is we will prognosticate what is the goal for each child and accordingly work on it i really do not believe in using the term normal uh, we would rather say uh, improvement functionally and to be able to lead an independent life 
the way that we would uh, quantify improvement would be clinical as well as uh, through imaging. Clinical would be uh, using parameters such as GMFM, GMFCS, and functional uh, FIM or functional improvement uh, measures. And a brain scan will show whether there is improvement in the brain functioning. Imagine so fully that there is no damage as such. Will stem cells still help? As there are no dead tissue to regenerate or revive. Yes. Uh, in fact, dead cells cannot be revived or regenerated. If you saw a scan which has showed that there was a gap in the brain, there was there was glyphic scar or dead tissue that will not improve. However, the areas which are functioning less, as seen in the PET scan, will improve. In the case of lysencephaly, we generally see that the number of cells are less, plus these cells are less functioning. As per the PET scan, we will see that they are. Uh, what PET scan does is it, it basically identifies the ability of the neurons to utilize glucose as a metabolism marker, and those uh, we find that many of these neurons are functioning less. Stem cells, as a mode of the paracrine effect, will stimulate these inactive or low-functioning cells to function better. So that's how it will help us in the time. If there are any more questions, please do email uh, to us at contact at neurogenbsi.com, and uh, one of our uh, we would get back to you. Will there be any adverse uh, effects to lysencephaly? Uh, we'll need to see the only adverse effect as uh, we do see is possibility of seizures if there is a history of seizures or epilepsy or if EEG is abnormal. Uh, so we would need to know that and. If uh, there is a potential, then we will need to cover with uh, anti-epileptics or medication to prevent seizures. Uh, no other side effects, long-term side effects are seen. Yes, this webinar will be emailed to uh, all those who have registered, and you will be able to see the webinar. Thank you, Shweta, uh, and hope I have been able to answer all your questions. Feel free to reach out to us at any point of time, and we would be happy to answer any questions which have been unanswered. Thank you, and have a good day.